Welcome to Poland Daily History with me, Nicholas Richardson. In this series of episodes, we're going to be looking at Polish history from a British perspective and also Anglo-Polish relations in a geopolitical context. And I'm delighted to have with me in the studio today Richard Barclay, who is half Polish. He's been living in Poland for 20 years and is able to bring a unique perspective onto this subject. Have you read Max Hastings' Armageddon? Not yet. Because his, his view, if, I, if I've understood it correctly, was that because of very weak American logistics and a desire by President uh, 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 Roosevelt to divide Berlin, to allow the Russians, out of respect, to enter Berlin at the same time. The whole of the, of the, of the Eastern Front moved far, far more slowly than it should have done. And there is a strong argument that the war could have ended at the end of 1944 and the Allies would have been well into Poland by that time. Yes. And that, that, that's... Now, when we're talking about the Allies, who was actually... We, we know from, from Yalta, or even Tehran, actually, that Churchill knew very well that the game was up for the British Empire and the, the superpowers, notwithstanding the fact that Russia was not an economic superpower, but, the, but in manpower and resources, uh, the, 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 the world was going to be run by, by two forces and the British Empire was not part of that. Now, that is something the Poles have to understand. Uh, you can see very well at the, at the, at the, at the photographs taken in, in, at Yalta in particular that Churchill was the odd well, man out. The other out. point, I think, is, yes, and the other point is, of course, that Roosevelt thought he knew Stalin better than Churchill. So he... Well, you he know why? Of... Because, because he, uh, the Uncle Joe idea... Exactly. But well, the point well, is that Stalin, being the sort of creature he was, could see that there was this division mm. between the... and exploited it. Marvellously, by telling jokes about Churchill. Exactly. He, so, he, so, the, so the point... And it came to that point when, unfortunately, because... Before the dropping of the atom bomb, the Americans assumed they would need Russian help in, in, the, in the Far East against Japan. Yeah. They were not prepared, I think, and Roosevelt was dying and was really not interested and didn't mm. appreciate exactly. the, the, need to, the need to do more, uh, in a practical sense, for, for Poland in this part of the world. Well, I think that's absolutely true. I, uh, I, and it's not as if the Americans didn't have experience of it, because Woodrow Wilson, after the First World War, you know, knew how to, yeah, exactly. knew how to, to send uh, actually a Marshall Plan to Poland, didn't he? It wasn't really a Marshall, called a Marshall Plan, but the, the, these vast supplies. No, I mean, I think, I think, I think it's probably true. But I think, you know, to give to give Britain yeah. her due, uh, I remember even when I was a child rationing in, food rationing in Britain in the fifties. Uh, Britain was bankrupted because of the war. It was, yes. I uh, mean, I think the Americans imposed very harsh settlements. Very the harsh United, settlements. They didn't impose on other European they, No, allies because they, they wanted to break countries. up the empire. Exactly, because they wanted the overseas trade opportunities. They wanted overseas trade opportunities. And, and they, 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 they got what they wanted um, at a huge cost to Britain. And I remember as a child, you know, deep resentment against the Americans in Britain. Deep resentment. And, but conversely, huge respect for the Poles. They do. Uh, huge respect. I mean, I remember at school, I was extra extraordinarily proud to say, I'm half Polish. And people say, what do you know about Poland? Nothing. Where is it? I don't know, but I'm half Polish. And, you know, people come, oh, the Poles were marvellous in the war, weren't they? You know, and this is absolutely the case. And this is forgotten. And it was, it was, you know, it was a compounded difficulty that the Poles were not invited to March in, 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 in VE. Well, that's technically not 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 right. I mean, they were there was there was a, there, there were there was eventually an invitation to both of both the new Polish government, the communist government, and the and the government in exile. But oh. for but for their uh, and th this is the you know this uh, in the this world of social murky. media, yes. this yeah. of course it gets a lot of resentment and uh, on social media. But uh, yeah, in typical fashion, it didn't quite go according to plan. So it ended up that very few people actually turned up. To, but to but March. I but I thought actually was. The Prime Minister was uh, worried about offending Stalin. But he probably was. But there was an invitation, not to the whole Polish armed force, I think, there were, but there, was certainly, there were certainly invitations given. But this little fact has been forgotten because the propaganda is much better than the... You know, yeah. can't let facts confuse the argument. These terrible perfidious Albion yet again. Yes, exactly. And I think the other point to make about the lack of uh, uh, understanding is, of course, once a war begins, yeah. it acquires its own momentum. Yes, of course. In any war, yes, anywhere in the world. So the idea you could start a war in September 1939 and expect that by the time you got to the end of that war, 
everybody would be in the same position and able to do what they'd hoped to be able to do is, of course, its own... Uh, well, you'd have thought the First World War would have, ta First World War would have taught people Which, of that. course, is why, if you look at it, you know, putting a more charitable view on appeasement, which is why the First World War taught people that mass slaughter of civilians and mass slaughter awful. generally was awful. Mm. Therefore, let's do anything to, to avoid, avoid it. it. Uh, but, 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 you know, I think this is... You see, it's very interesting. Recently, I, actually, I tried to get, do a, a television series on Polish war art, or rather First World War art coming from the region that is now known as Poland. Mm. And it's, ex it's extremely difficult. The Polish government knows where archives are in the Lwów, in Moscow, uh, but they don't really recognize that the artwork made by soldiers who were fighting for the Tsar or for, for either of the emperors was Polish, even though you know, the soldier was called Kowalski. You know. uh, and this is, this is really unfortunate because we're very fortunate in, in Britain, at the Imperial War Museum and elsewhere, having these vast archives of, of both uh, institutional art, I mean, government art, and, and newspapers, media art, and also just the art that soldiers did with their, with their backpack. Exactly, and, uh, yeah. Now, as the director of the National Museum here said to me, he said, well, you know, Polish soldiers were a lot poorer than British soldiers. They probably didn't have too many pencils. Um, but there is nonetheless artwork. And the, the fact that the, the Eastern Front or the Eastern uh, theater of war in the First World War was so different from the Western theater of war, it was much more mobile. You know, and it was, in a sense, total war for Poland, for the, the region that is Poland. Yes. Because you had, you had battles all over the place. Exactly. You know? It was a very fluid area. It was very fluid. And, of course, there were so many different tribes, so many different types of people, so many different ethnic groups. I mean, when we go to ethnic, it's actually worth making a point, isn't it, that if we look at the, the re-establishment of Poland after the, um, the First World War and mm. the, the, the Treaty of Riga, ah. Pilsudski, the leader... Was was very enlightened in the sense that you know there was no such thing as a true pole. You were Polish yeah. if you want. You, you were in this land of Poland, of course, and you were Polish if you wanted to be Polish, of course. And he wasn't bothered, or didn't think anybody else should be bothered, whether you were Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, no. No. neither of the, none of the above. No. Um, and 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 and, it's, and and of course, once he when, when he died, of course, the, the the climate I think in Poland slightly changed. Well, the political climate was poisonous always, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, and yeah. I mean. It, it, well, you know, I mean, what, what, what did Bismarck say? If you want to destroy the Poles, give them their freedom. Um, <laughs> and, I, I mean, and, 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 and you know, in, in, in a sense, that's what we're even seeing that today. But it is, oh, that's a good point, because now we are. We've, we've, been, we've been through the... In 1989, the wall came down. Mm. Polish approach to, 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 to that, and, and, and the contribution was great. Mm. And we're now in the, in the modern era where we're both, well, for the time being at least, members of the, of, of, of the European Union.